Hello everyone, no silly video for this video. We usually we use them all. The, we usually start off with a goofy video, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's nice. We just did a we just did an hour stream on uh the latest um the, the latest uh joyous document coming out of the DDF. We had a good laugh. Mm. And then in in between before you popped in, I was I was listening to uh the Pope's planer in chief tell everyone how happy he is that we finally have a good DDF prefect who answers questions right away. It's pretty cool. <laughs> good times, everyone. So, <laughs> but I, Matthew, I wanted to get you back on. We had you on a couple, a uh, couple weeks ago and yep. we talked about fasting, but I want to do St. Martin's Lent this year because I've never done, it, never done it before. And I need you to run me through everything that I need to do. I want you to give everybody a background of what St. Martin's Lent is. And mm -hmm. I think you have a book on it, right? A new book? I do. The Definitive Guide to Catholic Fasting and Abstinence. So Excellent, that is, that's going to be the, 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 you know, the resource I direct everybody to. Um, I do have an article as well. It's on the Ag Catholic Life website. Or if you look online, it's called St. Martin's Lent and the Fast of Advent. That's going to be excerpts from the book, kind of going over one Martin Mass and two St. Martin's Lent. Uh, but the book has more information too, you know, much more than uh, can be fit into an article or much more than we can even talk about now. I mean, there's so mm -hmm. many fast as we talked about fasting but i mean it's really only covering the surface and the fact is priests aren't even taught this you know yeah. more more actually like i know i met you at the coalition for cancel priest conference this year uh father lovell's very knowledgeable in fasting very knowledgeable on, on many different topics uh but a lot of priests really are not because they're not taught this they have to want to go learn to themselves and the resources just aren't all in one place and the same thing is is likely going to be true for St. Martin's Lent. I even found that I was trying to go to churches uh, to get the indulgence that starts at noon on All Saints Day and continues to All Souls Day, mm -hmm. and churches were locked. And I was going in and saying, hey, can you open this church so I can go and ask the secretary that, you know, I'd like to get an indulgence today. And the secretary was like, oh, I've never heard about this. Why didn't, why didn't Father tell me about this? I'm just going to random churches about this. And actually, the priest came outside and, you know, opened the door. And he's like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm here for the dollars. He's like, oh, OK, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, you can go inside. He's yeah, so like, what? I had no idea what <laughs> yeah. was going on. So, so much isn't even being taught because, unfortunately, seminaries prioritize. And, and you know, I, I studied a little bit in one and I have friends who are priests. And, you know, so much of it has gone to psychology and other things like that, that it's what does the faith teach? What does it mean to be a theologian? We build on previous teachings. We don't just say, I got some ideas. You know, this this is what the faith means. That's what we're seeing a lot now from priests. It is really superficial and that's a complaint. But we have a heritage that has to be built on. And the heritage of fasting has been lost. And part of that, St. Martin's Lent has certainly been lost. But I think before you know, we get into that, people should be aware of Martin Mass. You know, you, you guys are probably aware of Martin Mass. I hope you're preparing to celebrate. We're yeah. we're having our priest over for dinner on on Martin Mass, but it is really hard to find a goose up here. Yeah, yeah, and people might be like, "Well, what are you talking about?" Because <clears throat> goose is the traditional dish eaten on Martin Mass. And so I've I've never <clears throat> I've yeah. never. I've never celebrated Martin Mass, so you guys are going to have to fill me on on some traditions because I want to do it this year. Good. I want to bring it into my home, and I want to I want to start with Good. with with the feast, and then go into the fast. You know that that's a big part of what what I believe in is feast and fast is both. You got a mm -hmm. Friday absence, you got you got the importance of Sunday Mass, and same thing with all holy days. You got vigils and all. You got to live both. So Martin Mass. What's interesting? Let me just say, like this year. Because of when November 11th falls, you know, it falls on a Saturday and you wouldn't be going to fast on a Sunday. So I'm celebrating it Sunday as well. So oh. just this particular year, but usually November 11th is a big day. It's a big day in the life of Catholic. One, 
if you know if i mentioned november 11 to people you might think well that's you know originally armistice day it was you know when world war one ended at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month and thus it would be a great day to pray for you know souls lost in war or, and really all all souls as we continue on this tradition throughout november and that's great you know that's that's something that you know we should be doing the united states Change our Mrs. Day in 1954 to Veterans Day. So now the focus is kind of on veterans, but certainly would be a good practice to, to pray for veterans too. But there's so much more to November 11th than just that. That's kind of what a very much a um, surface level thing you might get from a priest is. What should I do? Let's pray for, you know, those who died in war. Great. But much more than that, November 11th is really the Catholic Thanksgiving. It is very much also the second carnival. So it is really the second Mardi Gras in the year. So and because it's the feast of St. Martin of Tours. St. Martin of Tours, the great worker of charity, he is said to have raised three people from the dead. He was, you know, as in the artwork you had <clears throat> before the show went up, you showed him as, you know, a, uh, an officer um, or, or so in the military, and he was cutting his cloak. And the famous story, of course, people should be familiar with that, is that um, basically Christ appeared to him. And he was just a catechumen at this point. And he cut part of his cloak to give him. And it was later revealed that that was Christ. And, you know, what a valuable lesson we can think about is how many instances in our own life, you know, in our own every day, do we have to do charity to others with works or with words or with good example or pointing out other sins, you know, these spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Because our Lord said, you know, what we have done for others, we've done to him. And what we've not done to others, we've not done for him. So there's an important lesson there. Uh, St. Martin uh, would go on to become a bishop. He became bishop of Tours. And his charity was so known that it was celebrated very much um, throughout Europe as uh, as a really important day. And actually a custom that really rose in the place was the carrying of lanterns. So sometimes you would see this in processions, children and families carrying lanterns around town. And then I see that sometimes a little bit with families now who want to revive traditions, get kids together, make some paper lanterns and celebrate and talk about the importance of charities. Martin Mass was a very important day for a lot of people. And goose was the traditional dish. Uh, wasn't St. Martin one of the first saints to be raised to, to, to be raised to the altars? In other words, like one of the first saints to be celebrated. Right. As, one of the first as... non-martyred. Because right. we know when we celebrated martyrs a long time ago, he was the first. So people who pray the divine office, you might be familiar, you know, with the divine office, traditional Roman bravery, the hymn, for instance, for confessors um, at Lauds. I believe that hymn was made originally for St. Martin. So he was the, the main example of, okay. of a confessor because originally you would celebrate the martyrs. And I mean, he was a great, great saint. Um, he wasn't a martyr. But thus the church began to celebrate confessors. Also, I don't want to go, you know, too much on a tangent. But uh, confessors originally referred to martyrs because you confess the faith up till death. Mm -hmm. And then confessors turned out to be those who confessed their faith and didn't die as martyrs. So depending on how far back you're going, you're reading something. You're talking about confessors. You could be talking about martyrs uh, or, or not. So uh, it just depends. But this particular day was was very important. Martyr Mass was a holiday in some countries, Germany, France, Holland, England, Central Europe. People would go to Mass, of course, very important day, but the rest of the day was spent as a holy day. You would play games, you would do dances, parades, the festive dinner with the traditional roasted goose. They would drink St. Martin's wine on this day as well, which is a name just for the first lot of wine made from grapes of the recent harvest. Um, there was a festival as well on this day, to really commemorate the filled barns. Um, it was, for many respects, just basically the Thanksgiving day of the Middle Ages. And it was connected with our faith, you know, as the harvest had taken place. Um, you know, it is really fallen out, but Father Weezer in the Handbook of Christian Feasts and Custom, great book made, you know, really in the middle 1900s, he noted at that point that it was still at least kept in some rural parts of Europe uh, with that same sort of fervor. But of course, fervor continues to die out in each generation as modernism and liberalism and all these errors really affect so many people. Um, but it's a great day. And it is something I encourage a lot of people to do. Keep it as a Catholic Thanksgiving, but also keep it as the second Mardi Gras because as we're gonna be talking about, it goes right into what we call as St. Martin's Lent, which is the true and original Advent fast. 
So is there any difference in the fasting from St. Martin's Lent and regular Lent that we prepare for yes. before Easter? Okay. Yes, there definitely is. I talk about the whole history of fasting and the definitive guide to Catholic fasting and absence. It changed considerably uh, over the centuries. Originally, as I talk about in the book, and I, I don't know if we talked about this on the show last time, but all, uh, well, this lasted for a long time. All fasting days were days of abstinence. Not all absence days were fasting days, but all fasting days, days of absence. What did it mean to abstain? Well, in the very early church, it meant it was vegan. So there was no seafood allowed, no fish, no animal products, no dairy, no butter. Get rid of all that. It was vegan. Um, you couldn't even have water originally very early on. So after a few hundred years, you could finally have water throughout the day. But originally you did not. You would have your meal uh, after sunset as well, one meal, and it was done. Uh, around the 1800, I mean, sorry, around the 800, you had the first instance with the monks getting the exception to have a collation in the evening, which was originally just a little wine. It turned into you could be a small, a small snack, basically. Eventually, over time, it became, you know, eight ounces was considered to be the collation. It spread to the faithful. Uh, but definitely by the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, we have a distinction with Lent is different. He even talks about this in the Summa. This is in the Summa where it says in Lent, one may not consume animal products. So milk, for instance, cheese, dairy. Fish was allowed by this point. You know, St. Gregory the Great allow, allowed fish to be, be consumed. And that's why we associate a lot of fish with, with Lent and Fridays. But originally, fish was not allowed for hundreds of years. But he still notes, this is St. Thomas Aquinas and Summa, that dairy products were forbidden. Anything that really came from a mammal. And that will continue for centuries. In fact, we really even had, uh, I talk about this in the book and in articles as well, and this is something priests aren't talked about, faithful might be scandalized by too, honestly, and it's that uh, Sundays in Lent, you could not, you, for instance, in America, Sunday in Lent, until the time of really Pope Leo the Thirteenth, the end of the 1800s, you could not consume milk, no cheese, no dairy, nothing like that. It was still days uh, that you could not do so. And there were all these exceptions for different places. And I mean, we're not going to go over that, but in the book is really interesting. It just shows the gradual weakening of practice. But to your question, yes, there is a distinction because St. Martin's Lent tends to follow the days of absence of other days, as opposed to, you know, some... <laughs> Wait, did you read that comment? <laughs> Matthew thinks St. Gregory the Great is a liberal. <laughs> He did have liberalizing policies. Yes. <laughs> I, so I have been known to, to criticize some. I mean, saints make mistakes. You know, I've talked about that before in hindsight, prudential mistakes. I think some of the changes, if you really study it, this changes to holy days and, and fasting days under even St. Pius X were very severe. He really watered yeah. a lot of things down yeah. so much. So we went from 36 official holy days of obligation beforehand you know, any what drops it down to six, so much so that his successor adds two back, or he dropped it on eight and two back. I forget exactly, but he he eliminated a lot of days, even though they weren't practiced everywhere. He just you know remove them. So it's okay. You can you can say in hindsight, I would do something differently. Doesn't mean he's not a saint. You would be a great pope, Matthew. <laughs> you would restore tradition, boy. <laughs> to restore all things in Christ was Saint Pius X's motto. But yeah. yeah, that didn't mean he was restoring fasting days. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, the Advent fast, I think we should talk a little bit about it. it's It's old. Okay. It yeah, goes back than... at least to the year 480. So we're not talking about some medieval invention, you know, around the time of Charlemagne. We're not talking about some, you know, practice now where people are saying, let's, you know, try to add some piety, you know, to prepare for Christmas, which nothing wrong with that. Uh, but we're talking about an ancient observance. It, it was really came, if you study uh, St. Gregory of Tours' History of the Franks, we we find that St. Perpetuus, uh, one of his predecessors in the sea, decreed in 480 that the faithful were there to fast three times a week from the Feast of St. Martin up until Christmas. And the period was to be called St. Martin's Lent. And his feast was to be kept with the same kind of rejoicing uh, as Carnival. And uh, over time, uh, you know, some changes happened and, and it gradually uh, grew to 40 days in some places. Um, the Patriarch of Constantinople um, in the 6th century said that flesh meat, uh, there would be total absence from that from 40 days preceding the nativity. And that was in the 6th century. The Bishop of Metz in 742 said that all um, religious who take vows 
were bound to daily absence and fasting until the ninth hour from St. Martin's Day to the Nativity. So um, there tends to be a, a large connection when we talk about St. Martin's Lent with monks. So that's yeah. also why there was some uh, disagreement in the Greek church as well. Um, you know, for instance, this was, uh, I found an interesting passage because some Greek Catholics still keep a similar practice, but they call it St. Philip's Lent. So if you look online, you see St. Philip's your Lent, you're like, oh, is this something different? No, it's just a different word because for them, this particular fasting period uh, begins after the Feast of St. Philip on, on the Byzantine calendar. Uh, but but Dom Geringe writes, you know, the Greek church continues to observe the Feast of Advent, though with much less rigor than that of Lent. For them, it consists of 40 days beginning November 14th, the day on which their church keeps the Feast of the Apostle St. Philip. For the Greek Catholics during this period, the people abstain from flesh meat, butter, milk, and eggs, but they are allowed those which they are not allowed during Lent, namely fish, oil, and wine. Uh, fasting in the strictest sense, though, is binding only on seven out of the 40 days, and the whole period goes under the name of St. Philip's Lent. The Greeks justify these relaxations under the key distinction that the Lent before Christmas is, as they say, an institution of the monks, whereas the Lent before Easter was instituted by the apostles. So oh, wow. that is why we talk about a little bit of a difference here, a little bit of different practice too. Um, but for those people listening who've never heard of it, uh, this is something I personally have been doing for a number of years. And it's something I highly encourage people to do. And we can talk a little bit in a bit about the practicals of how to do it, but the purpose we want to become holy. You know, we yeah. want to prepare for Christmas. If you've observed the strictness of the Lenten fast, you know how much more meaningful Easter is. You can finally have meat. You can have Easter eggs. You can have eggs. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people, I encourage them to give up alcohol during this period like I do, too. So you give up things you like in addition to fasting and abstaining like our forefathers did, which was very hard. And, and Easter means so much more. And I think that's a lot of reasons why when you look at old surveys, when you ask, you know, Americans, what are your top holidays? Easter is always high up there. Easter is no longer up there, but it means so much when you're preparing and it comes. And Christmas will mean so much more. I can say this from experience when you don't celebrate it during Advent. You know, you're not listening to Christmas music. You're not going to Christmas parties. You're not having your chocolate now. It's a fasting period. You are preparing and then you are ready to celebrate Christmas and the stroke of midnight when December 25th comes and you're at midnight mass and the fast is finally over and Christ is born at the same time. You're also thinking about, you know, the end of times as Advent has been the focus too. And we offer to our Lord who will come again in the end of times, these, these sacrifices, which hopefully we've offered in the state of grace. So they're meaningful. So there's a lot of complexity to this, but we can actually do this. And I talked about this at the Coalition for Cancel Priest Conference this year, how we offer it up for priests, offer it up for souls, offer it up for penance. So it's not just, an, uh, let's, let's punish myself want to lose some weight you know um you know it's it's no, not like I, no, I, it's very much a spiritual benefit i found that if i fast for just nebulous reasons i always fail but mm -hmm. if i pick a very specific intention for what i'm fasting for i'm able to succeed because then you're not right. doing it for yourself because it's hard to do things for yourself but that's you why diets fail yeah you know people have diets diet, diet fail. it's different when you're saying i am fasting i'm offering it to god much yeah, easier to is, reject it, temptation there's graces that God gives you to get through it. I'm always successful in my Lenten fast where I've never been successful at diets where um, I, I think the last couple of years I've really had such amazing experiences during Lent when I took it seriously. I, because even I remember uh, when I first converted, I would, you know, I'd give up something stupid like uh I mean, I don't want to say chocolate because I hate chocolate, uh, but I would give something <laughs> stupid like that up and I got, I got no benefit from it, but right. the last couple of years I went full vegan and it was extremely difficult, but so exciting. Like you said, some on of Easter, the man. best things you can do only come through difficulty. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Some of the greatest but, achievements in your life. You don't just stumble upon them. You work for and, and offering those up for very specific intentions. One year was for, to save my marriage. And I really truly believe it did save my marriage. Um, this year I have a very specific intention. I'm not going to say publicly, but I'm, I'm fasting for, for two things very specifically that I, that I really want to dedicate the St. Martin's Lent to. Well, you know, we always have to go back to what our Lord himself said. And of course he is God. 
and um, and fully man too. He fasted, and he said some demons are driven out only by prayer and fasting. And isn't it really remarkable when you think about it? He gave the apostles power. And they went around and they're casting out devils. But despite the fact that our Lord directly, physically on this earth gave them this ability, they still couldn't cast out some devils. And they came back to him. They asked, why not? And you would think, well, I mean, certainly, you know, he had the power to do so. He did so validly. There's there's no man, you know, can't get into those kind of questions that you would get with priests and bishops and so. But why? And he said, some demons are driven out only by prayer and fasting. And, you know, if God himself can fast. Who are we to exempt ourselves? You know, he who had no sin. So you just always going back then. You see, like, what did the Desert Fathers do? What did all the saints do? You know, I mean, some of the great champions of religious order, St. Norbert, for instance, was known for heroic fasting. You know, and people don't really talk about that. People leave over, but he really, even St. Patrick, so many of the saints did so many sacrifices and and, and they lived, their, you know, their life. And, you know, St. Francis of Paula, Huge, you know, some of these saints perpetual abstinence their whole life, not because for some reason they wanted to uh, adopt, you know, a crazy, um, uh, you know, vegetarian mindset. They did so even though they like it, but they did so to offer for God. And, you know, I just saw that question come up. All of this is covered in the book, The Definitive Guide to Catholic Fasting and Abstinence. So St. Martin's Lent is covered in there, Rogation Days, Ember Days, Vigils, you know, history of, you know, fasting from, from the beginning Till really after Vatican II and uh, the Eucharistic fast too. So, so much more in there. So there's, there's um, also uh, for, for any, uh, somebody had mentioned it earlier in the comments. They said fasting is the, uh, the greatest uh, weapon to combat sins of the flesh. Yes. Um, fasting is it's, if you're struggling with any sins of the flesh, the, the belly is the root of everything, right? Like getting, getting, if you can conquer your belly, you'll have, you'll, you'll build virtue in other areas. Of, St. Thomas life. talks about this in the Summa. He talks about fasting them for three purposes. And one of them is to conquer the desires of the flesh, you know, and to lift your mind to contemplate heavenly things. So there's, there's so much we can, we can offer it, you know, in reparation for sin, you know, Our Lady of Fatima, so much about offering reparation you can actually offer something you know on days i fast i specifically change the wording of my morning offering prayer just a little bit to mention i also offer up my fasting because i want it to be really conscious to me i really want to know about it so um that's something for people to keep in mind to be very intentional you know and it's also important this is not a diet you know yeah. if you're fasting you need to pray more you have more time you're not cooking you're not you're not worried about this hopefully to get your mind off of not eating Pray more. So many people don't have time for the rosary, don't have time for mass. But guess what? You're going to have more time, you know, and, and that's what we want to do. And, um, you know, there was a um, something I thought was really powerful. So, um, you know, I also, you know, oversee the the programs, the religious education programs at catechismclass.com. You know, we offer religious education courses for all ages and we help adults. One of the things I love doing so much is just helping adults to better relearn the faith. You know, who've been properly, who've been poorly catechized to help them properly catechize themselves. And, and part of that mindset is understanding there's many different catechisms, you know. And one of these catechisms that I'm drawing on a lot for St. Martin's Lent is the Catechism of Perseverance. Um, and this is what it says um, The church neglects no means of revisiting in her children the fervor of their ancestors. Is it not just? Is the little babe whom we expect less beautiful, less holy, less worthy of our love now than he was formerly? Has he ceased to be the friend of pure hearts? Is he coming into our souls less needed now? Alas, perhaps we have raised there all the idols that 18 centuries ago he came to overturn. Let us therefore be more wise. Let us enter into the views of the church. Let us consider now this tender mother, how she redoubles her solicitude to form in us those dispositions of penance and charity, which are necessary for a proper reception of the babe of Bethlehem. Wow. And I think that is the mindset of why are we doing this? We're doing it that to offer our Lord who took on human flesh to become man for the sole purpose of saving us and saving the human race, that we offer this to him as a birthday present. That is it. And is he less worthy? 
now than he was before when our ancestors did so uh, under obligation in some nations. Now, St. Martin's Lent wasn't always practiced under obligation everywhere, but it was in some places. And in some places, it was just pious devotion where people did so. Did they, you know, in their society have more sins than we do now that they needed to offer this penance and we don't? You know, really how absurd we are to think that. And, you know, one of the great uh, one of the greatest saints who I have a particular devotion to because of his connection with catechesis is St. Charles Borromeo. And we also talk about, you know, the great things he did during the plague at that time, going out on the streets, saving people when all the, you know, the secular leaders left. Uh, but he did also so much for fasting. I talk about that in, in, in my book too. He was really instrumental there, if, for instance, in bringing the church in Milan back to observe St. Martin's Lent. So I mentioned before, around 480, we have a mention, St. Martin's Lent is taking place. It goes to St. Perpetuus. Monks are beginning to observe it some, uh, under obligation. And it really continued to be you know, in the force until the 12th centuries. But by the 1100s, uh, in many places, it was, just, it was just a simple absence. It was no longer fasting. Um, the Council of Salisbury in 1281 held that only monks were expected to keep the fast going forward. But in a revival of the older tradition, Pope Urban V in the year 1362 required abstinence for all members of the papal court during Advent, yet that too did not last. So thus it kind of fizzled out. So St. Charles Borromeo comes on the scene, you know, after the Protestant revolt in the 16th century, and he urges and really requires the faithful under his charge in Milan to observe fasting and absence on the Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays of Advent. So if you remember, it started Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and uh, then it spread to 40 days, uh, and, but he really was adamant on this has to be kept. And Dom Guerinjay talks about that at length too in his uh, in his liturgical year. What's interesting is you know when we talk about you know more in our modern times, there's actually some remnants of St. Martin's Lent that really remained into the 19th century. So for instance, Wednesdays and Fridays were mandatory days of fasting for American Catholics really until the 19th century. So if, first of all, the, the Wednesdays of Avon went away for American Catholics in, a, in the 1840s. So beforehand, it was obligatory. You had a fasten of saying on Wednesdays in Advent um, and Fridays in Avon. That, like I said, Wednesdays in Advent went away in 1840. By the time of St. Pius X, the, you know, the 1917 Code of Canon Law, he does away with Wednesday um, abstinence in Advent for everybody else who still had it. And he also does away with Friday abstinence in Advent. So that's how long American Catholics kept it until the 1970 Code of Canon Law. And many other places did, but there was also, you know, a lot of the research, and I talk about this in my article, in my book, I've tried to find things from other countries too, to make it not just an American focus. Um, but there was actually a requirement in Italy on Saturday abstinence uh, throughout, um, uh, throughout Advent as well. So anybody who's familiar mm -hmm. with, who's read my book, no, I talk about, Saturday absence was required for American Catholics also until the middle of the 1800s. That went away about time. But really, there was a decree in Italy in 1906 that said even uh, even at that point, you had to keep Saturday absence at Advent. So you had some vestiges of this, you know, even though it fizzled out. And, and really, by that point, by the 1970 code, it kind of just all went away. And what do you have left? You just have the Ember Days, which fall during Advent, and you had uh, Christmas Eve. Was it was a fasting day, a fasting day for a long time, and unfortunately, those really go away, you know, in the 1960s. So, so much was was lost, but it was so robust practice for so long in in different degrees. Uh, but you know, thinking again, you know, what the Catechism Perseverance said, you know, why is our Lord less worthy now of penance, especially when Our Lady of Fatima comes in 1917 and implores more penance after all of these centuries of mitigations, you know, and yeah. people, you know, no longer <laughs> observing this. So there's so well, much I never, I never even heard of Ember Day. I mean, I'm, I'm cradle Catholic. I've been Catholic my whole life. I heard of Ember Days for the first time in 2017. Yeah. And I'm like, what the heck? Are that's Ember why Days? I feel like so many Catholics need to be properly re-catechized. You know, that's, yeah. that's what I do in catechismclass.com. That's what I do through articles I write, through speeches, because there's so much of the faith that is not being taught. I mean, I remember once I heard a, a girl say that uh, actually about Ember Days that they can't be real. And I said, how can they not be real? And she said, well, I went to Catholic school for 12 years. If they were real, I <laughs> learned about it. Well, the thing, the thing that really, uh, that really 
I've re- I've I've really come to appreciate is the, if you follow the liturgical calendar, God really does have a way that He had the church institute a way of whipping you back into shape when you've gotten a little lackadaisical. So uh, we just went through the summer. I did a lot of partying over the summer, going out on the boat every weekend. And coming into Advent, I really do want to get back into a penitential state of mind. I want to get back into a, a fasting mode and prayer mode before Christmas. And it, mm-hmm. it really is like divine providence that we have these things. And it's, it's a tragedy that we lost. Yes. Them. And it is for our aid. It's medicine. You know, it's medicine yeah. for the soul. But um, it is you're not alone. You know, a lot, don't don't feel like. You should have known this if, if you don't. Most people aren't taught this. Most, almost everything what I've covered, I mean, I have had priests read my book who say 95% of it is new to them on fasting because yeah. it's simply not taught. Um, but uh, the point is, you know, it's never too late to adopt it. And, you know, when we talk about adopting it, I think there's a couple things you can do. One, you can do the basic method of, Wednesdays, you know, um, Monday. Well, Wednesday, let's do that. Friday. Let's go, let's go through what what people can do if they want to participate in St. Martin's Lent. Are right. there, I think are there's there two. I really it? think there's two tracks. Okay. And the first track would be, you know, what do they do in the very very early practice? The one that St. Charles Borromeo revived, and it's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Fridays, of course, already days of absence. So Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and days of fasting. Um, and that begins at not during Roman Advent, you know, that begins, you know, after St. Uh, Martin of Tours feast day. So after Martin Mass. So, so we're looking November at next 12. week, Monday, Monday next week would be the first day of this fast. Minimally, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. Okay. Um, but I do encourage those who can keep it stricter to do all the 40 days. So, uh, you know, that therefore what I'm talking about is Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays also as days of abstinence and days of fasting. Sundays, it doesn't need to be disciplined. Um, I personally, since uh, I will probably keep Sundays as days of abstinence, too. You certainly can. There's, uh, you know, some people think, oh, I can't do absence on Sunday. It's sinful. That's not true. You, you can certainly do absence on Sunday. There's, there's no law against uh, being able to do absence Sunday. In fact, it's required during Lent. So uh, traditionally, you know, before the mm-hmm. what a lot of people know about. So you certainly could do that. Sundays are not an appropriate day for fasting, though. So just keep Sundays off of fasting. You can have saying no if you want. But like I said, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, definitely keep those. Uh, in addition, if you want, and if you can, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Now, the next question that always comes up, well, what do you mean by fasting? Understand abstinence. So you're saying no flesh meat, but because it's different than Lent, you can have milk products and fish. Yes, that is what I'm saying. Uh, for fasting, what does it mean? What does the church say? Church always said fasting is a, is a day of one meal. So preferably it should be had after sunset, an invitation of what our ancestors did for so long. It can, you know, it can be moved up. It was moved up to 3 p.m. at a certain point in history. Some places have it at noon. For a long time, though, it had to be afternoon. So I would say have your meal, you know, anytime convenient for you in the latter, you know, part of the day, whether that's three, five, seven. But if you can wait till after sunset, all the better. Now, um, now for people, just who one find meal. That, people who find that daunting, to only have one meal at dinner um, is, do you think they should, as we're coming up on, I mean, especially this week, I, I would mm-hmm. say this week. So you have uh, five days to get yourself used to it. I would say push off breakfast as long as you can skip breakfast. Yeah. Maybe go to lunch for the next five days and kind of just prepare yourself for it. And then when Monday comes really just try to go throughout your day and just have right. dinner. And I will say it might be hard for a few days. It usually is. After you do it for a week, after you roll into it, it's going to be much easier. It's just like, you know, somebody who, you know, you're exercising. It might be harder after a few days. A few days you're like, I'm in this rhythm. I got it going. Do not give up. You know, unless you have a legitimate health reason that truly prohibits you from, from fasting and your doctor says do not fast, you can do so. It's okay to feel hungry. You're going to feel hungry. That's what fasting is. It doesn't mean you're ill, you know, unless you have a health condition, you know. So it's okay to feel pain. 
you're offering yeah. up something. It's okay to feel like, I really wish I could have the burger now. Like, why did I have to do that? That's okay to have those feelings of, I wish I could have this, but you can't, you say no. Think about it, Adam and Eve, the sin they committed was because they couldn't say no to a piece of fruit. Yeah. You know, I'll tell really you, you want to know what you want to know what strangely helped me with fasting is <laughs> watching this stupid show alone on History Channel <laughs> and people would go out <laughs> into the middle of nowhere and they have to basically live on their own and c come up with their own food. But several of the contestants made it 60 days with no food longer than the no food at all no no food intake just water these people made it on because wow. they they gained a bunch of weight before they went on and they were able to stick it out for 60 days with zero car, uh, calories and if somebody can do that I for legal purposes daily. please don't try that guys no yeah yeah i'm not <laughs> suggesting you do that but the idea is the, mm -hmm. it's funny because after you the less you eat, the less hungry you are. So if you eat breakfast in the morning, you'll be hungry throughout the whole yeah, day. Yeah, because it stimulates your metabolism. Absolutely. Yeah. But if you push off that first meal, it actually, you don't get hungry. Right. It's when you when you start to eat, that's when you start to actually get hungry. So again, you know, like I said, every a fasting day has to only be one meal. But, you know, if people need these snacks, so, you know, unfortunately, I think the church's language now complicates things because they tell people fasting day is one meal and two smaller meals don't call those smaller things meals because a meal has a connotation of sitting down and dining it's not um the first earlier meal is actually a frustulum let's or call no it a frustulum and the church for a long time mandated was to be no more than two ounces so yeah, there's actually no a bar, limit something there. like that a piece of bread too you know is yeah. a good one too but for a long time can't be buttered because, you know, you want to use yeah. butter. So I don't want to get too hung up on that. But if you need basically a morning snack, it's a frustulum, you can take it. But like you said, if you're doing it, it might be stimulating your appetite. So it's better to say, no, I don't need this thing. You don't have to take these, these smaller snacks. Same thing with the evening, the collation that I mentioned really goes back to the 800s. It started with monks uh, as wine. Then it began, you know, with, uh, you have a little food spread to the faithful. You don't have to have that. So a lot of this, you know, makes a little bit more sense when the main meal isn't like a lot of people do now where they have dinner really late at night. It doesn't make sense to have snack afterwards. You already waited all day. You know, a lot of this is, you know, I have my main meal at three, for instance, which is when it was moved up to, you know, to coincide symbolically, at least with our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Thus, then you go back to work and you're doing things. So you might be hungry at night. So you have that collation. The collation was eight ounces. So, you know, it's a bit more substance, but actually eight ounces is kind of a lot. I think if you're taking that, that full amount, um, that, that's actually a lot. But remember, these are optional for some people like me. I'd rather not do them, um, you know, and, and omit them. But if you want, you know, drop the, the morning for stulum. If you want to do the evening collation, sometimes what I tell people is maybe just a protein shake, you know, like, a, for instance, a vegan protein shake you can have and then um because then we could get in a whole nother discussion about an article i wrote about what does it mean to be a liquid you know liquids are allowed what does it mean of course putting your food in a blender and pureeing it and drinking it and saying it's a liquid that's not actually a liquid you know yeah. there's a whole definition of liquids need to aid digestion they need to be really you know um they have no uh you know, basically no, no, no nutritional caloric. value so we would yeah, say no really caloric. close to or no calories too and, and you know they and they of course have to be drunk but blending your food up does not count um there's a couple <laughs> of questions matthew i want to i want to make sure we get to these questions yes if we observe saint martin's lent can we still celebrate and feast on thanksgiving day yeah that that's a good question and i think that's also part of the adapting of these practices there's two personal things that i am going to do to adapt that, you know, framework of one meal a day. I'm going to do all 40 days. God willing, I'd be able to do so. Um, no fasting on Sundays, but fasting and absence the other days uh, up until Christmas. Uh, the exception is Thanksgiving. I will still only eat one meal, so I will treat it as a fasting day. Uh, most people should anyway, because your meal is so large. Is that <laughs> better? So, I mean, I feel like most people tend to wait around hungry to dinner anyway, and they just, you know, so, I mean, you could truly, and that's what I will do. Uh, and I think it would be appropriate to have meat at that meal, just just for our culture right? yeah. and the custom that we have here. And the other exception, I will say, is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. You know, the patroness of America, a holy day of obligation on years when it does not fall on a Friday. 
and uh, I don't believe it's it's on a you know Friday this year. Um, is yeah, it, those are two good it, exceptions. It is actually. Oh, it is on is a it? Friday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> then in that case, there should be no there should be no meat uh, on that. Even though, see, that's the thing about the 1917 code. The 1917 code changed it beforehand. If a holy day of obligation fell on a Friday, it was still a day of absence unless the Pope granted a dispensation. As of the 1970 code, a holy day can automatically override Friday absence. So I, I'm still good. If it's a Friday, I'm going to be observing absence. The yeah. only really traditional exception is Christmas, which only dates to the time of St. Francis of Assisi, where if it was Christmas Day, it would uh, automatically override it. But for a long time, it just didn't. Wait, we haven't celebrated Christmas Day since the time of St. Francis of Assisi? No, 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 no. No, no uh, so... As of the time of St. Francis, Jesus, he petitioned the Pope at the time, if Christmas were to fall on a Friday, oh, okay. I was like, wait, not what? No way. Day, <laughs> that's where that goes back to. Okay. And things like the crazy Protestants were right all along. Oh, man, it's a pagan <laughs> holiday. <laughs> but if you think about it, that's still over a millennium uh, because we know, you know, the weekly fast, uh, uh, you know, on Fridays went back to the time of the Apostles, over a millennium that Christmas falls on a Friday, it's still a day of absence. So um, in that case, then the, personally this year, the only thing I think that would make sense is Thanksgiving to be, you know, an exception yeah. for me. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Cause, uh, and especially like, you don't want to be a drag on your family function either because correct. It, it, it's, it, it, then you're telling people you're fasting, you know, when you do fast, you're not, you know, you're supposed to be chipper and up and not, yeah where you're fasting on your sleeve, like Jesus says. And mm -hmm. so I, th I think that's a good exception too. I I'm really going to challenge anybody that's watching this to really give this a shot because mm -hmm. we need to do penance and we need to fast right now. I mean, things are getting so bonkers. If you go back and listen to the show we did before this, we're right. all going to have to face God one day and give an account. And some of those things are going to be, what did you do? as penance because mary calls for penance in every apparition she comes in jesus tells us we need to pray and fast for certain demons we know that penance has always been a tradition of the church to help mm -hmm. our spiritual lives we really do have to step it up a little bit and i think this is an amazing opportunity for everybody to really it is and it's modeled after the tradition of what our forefathers did we're not inventing it you know we are continuing you know the tradition and um it's important to know you're not alone you know yeah. Because other people do. So I part, you know, I, I run the Fellowship of St. Nicholas. So if you go to onepeter5.com backslash fast, it's information about our fellowship. Just people who you can join different tiers, basically, but it's just different ways to observe fasting from, you know, working your way up maybe over time to tier three. Um, but the important part of that is, you know, kind of learning a little bit more about what we stand for, these different tiers. But at the very bottom, how to join, there's a link to our Telegram group. And uh, mm -hmm. I would encourage people, if you have Telegram, click that link and join. We often um, post articles, you know, regarding these different times throughout the year, vigils, Lent, Ember Days, Assumption Fast, you know, all, all different things in there. But it's also an opportunity for people to, one, ask questions. You got a question on something relating to fasting and absence, ask that. And then I or somebody else, you know, just comments in there. And two, it's important to realize you're not alone. You know, if you're joining this fast and you you feel alone, you're like, well, nobody else at the parish is observing. And they say Advent doesn't start for weeks. Uh, you're not alone. There are well over 300 people actively engaged right now in the group who are observing. Yes, I think it's at 343 or something like that. There's yeah. a lot of people in there. Yeah, so you're not alone. So we need more people. You know, we need more people to offer up the penance. So please join us. I'm definitely doing it this year, Matthew. Um, I, I probably would have never even heard of it without you. So I'm really glad we got to have this conversation. You're awesome, man. And I think we got to get you on before Lent again, too, to really give us a little pep talk because it's quite motivational to hear you uh, talk about fasting. You know, Pope Benedict the Fourteenth said Lent was the badge of Christian honor. And yeah. by it, we avert the scourges and the wrath of God. And that if we... Do not observe it. If mankind grows remiss in it, it will be to the detriment of, of our society, of our civil society. And, and it would be a direct insult to God and a detriment to his glory. And what has society done since he said that in 1741? Yeah. Look at the collapse. And he's actually the first person that allowed me to be had during Lent. 
he kind of begrudgingly gave in. He said all these forces are conspiring against him and people are demanding, you know, for instance, Tuesdays and Thursdays have meat at the main meal. And he gives in. And he thought, well, maybe one day I can reclaim it. People take that and run with it. And but at the same time, he gives this, you know, really forceful admonition to, to continue to observe this. And nobody does because people want to do the minimum. You know, people really want to do the minimum. And that's why, you know, people go and say, well, what does it mean? I want an exception for capybara. I want an exception for puffin like they did in France. I, I want to be able to eat beaver in some places. All these people trying to now redefine over the centuries, what does meat, you know? And, and what, what do our ancestors, the martyrs, you know, who died, you know? What, there was a famous martyr who was uh, murdered in Spain, you know, in the 200s. And he refused to drink water on his way to execution because at that time you could not even have water on a fasting day. And this was just a regular Wednesday or Friday fasting day, refusing it, saying he'll drink his water in heaven because he will not break the fast. That's the kind of fervor yeah. that our ancestors wow. had. And I'm sure, well, they look down from heaven. They see us now. They're there. And the shame they see some of it. So let us offer to God and in honor of our ancestors who, who observe these are in heaven and of all the saints. And this is the octave day of all saints, of course, you know, if you follow the older calendar. So it's important to understand we have this great testimony witnesses, you know, in heaven looking down on us. Um, let us really understand we're united with them. And they went before us and observed these practices. Who are we in a society that sins as much as we do? and really transgresses the law of God to say, we don't need more penance. We need it more than they did, not less. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Look at the way. It's so true. Ever since they started relaxing all these, all these different things, you just see the society around us collapsing. I mean, if we can, if we can maybe do something in our own lives and even look, I know so many people who have their, they, they are practicing the faith, but their spouse isn't. They are practicing the faith, but their children fell away. These are the things you should be offering up your fast for. Your mm -hmm. spouse who isn't going to mass, your children who left the faith. This is what you offer your fast for. You want somebody in your life to convert? How bad? Right. Do you really right. want them to convert? Here you go. Here's the and way. You sometimes wonder, is it a demon preventing them? Is it a demon dragging them to sin, preventing them from getting to mass for this? Our Lord says some demons are only driven out by prayer and fasting. God yeah. himself said this. So who are we to, you know, exempt ourselves from voluntary fast? So that uh, I actually had, this is the person I had, like I spoke earlier. I, I had a, about an hour conversation with, um, with one of our viewers today. And it was a really good conversation. And I, I told him to watch this show because I, I have, I have personally experienced the fruit of fasting in my own life with my wife when Good. I had converted and she hadn't yet. So I encourage him to watch this show. I'm going to be offering my fasting for, for his situation that he's going through and also for something very personal. So anybody else that's struggling with a family member who hasn't converted, I'm telling you, this is the way to get your family to convert. Mm -hmm. So Matthew, you got anything to promote? <clears throat> Um, well, I mean, if somebody, you know, if you go to the, for instance, that article of mine, so, so I'm on Patreon, if anybody wants to support me on Patreon, the work I do or anything, but, um, uh, there's a, there's, I have a shop on Patreon too. And this is also linked to, I think in the bottom of the one Peter five article, but I, but I also make a calendar of these particular, uh, days so people can see at a glance, you know, is it a full liturgical year? No, it's just fasting. I'm only caring about fasting. Okay. okay yes, okay. it looks generally like this. It's 2023. 2024 has come out. So I've uh, I have created that. But I make for this is and this is free too. You can just take this from the website. But I also make and sell for just a few dollars a digital one. So you want to add it to your your Outlook, you want to add it to your Google Calendar, your Apple Calendar, wh whatever. You can do so, and then you can give you know set them for reminders and such. Because I think it is necessary to integrate it into your life. So that's something we have to do more of. We have to make sure we are doing whatever we can to, you know, further the faith, you know, save souls. But same thing, like if you take your job seriously, you're not just, you know, going to plan, you're going to plan in advance, you know, I'm going to schedule things make sure things get done. Why do, you know, people not take the same with their spiritual life? If you're saying, I want, to, you know, things to be different with my family or with my spouse or with my children or, or with my society, you know, and the laws we, we have, you know, you have means to do so. Don't just wish for it. You know, yeah. take some action. Fasting is a way to actually take action. You know, you're not yeah, just pr wishing. prayer without fasting is wishing. Right. You're just wishing. 
And yeah. fasting without prayer is a diet. Yes. You know, so and diets fail, but fasting, yeah. you know, the thing too is I think fasting for a lot of people is a lot different than dieting because with dieting, you cheat. You're like, well, I, I, you know, I'm looking at certain many calories. This is just a little snack here, you know, but I mean, yeah. with fasting, God sees everything. I can't have that. doesn't matter how small it is. I'm breaking the fast and I will not break the fast because God sees everything at all times. So practicing the presence of God, that technique is also helpful during this period too. But it's important to know when things get rough, you know, after a few days, you might be like, why am I doing this? Keep in mind that passage, is our Lord, the babe of Bethlehem, less worthy now to receive our sacrifices? And just understand too that physically it might take a couple of weeks, might take a week or so, but eventually you're going to like it. And yeah. like me, probably at the end of it, you'll be like, I wish I could go back to that. I had so much more time. I didn't have to worry about what I'm making for lunch. Didn't have to worry about breakfast. Could they get more things done for work or my family or my prayer? It just adds simplicity to your life. You yeah. know, he needs, you need to master yourself. You know, if you can't master yourself, you can't say no to sin. That's what a lot of fasting is about. You must master yourself and grow in virtue. Hard to grow in virtue if you can't say no to sin. And if you can't say no to eating a little something, how can you resist serious sin? It's always been like the mindset of the church. And also like St. Basil the Great said that your guardian angel is more closely aligned to you in proportion to your fasting. Oh, so, wow. Fast more, you know, deep in your relationship with your already an angel this Advent. And of course, I'm talking about St. Martin's Lent, the true Advent, because Advent used to be much longer than it currently is in the Roman Rite. Rome reduced it to four weeks, but the Church of Milan, the Ambrosian Rite, still keeps it as those six weeks, one of the few places it did. Yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, a lot of people think being a traditional Catholic is about the traditional Latin Mass, and it's really not. It's about fasting. Right. It's, it's about, about living. Faith. The faith, you know, that's what it is. And that, and we do that through the mass. We do that through fasting. We do that through the traditional Eucharistic fast. We don't just say, I just like it because it's beautiful or, yeah. or because I like the music. No, we do it because our Lord instituted it because the beauty draws us in and we see the truth. Truth draws us in. Fasting has truth too. You know, our Lord chose the way of the cross, you know, despite all the sacrifices that it entailed and the pain and the horror of it and he chosen he would have chosen it again and again and again and fasting is such a small cross to bear compared to what our lord bore you know he who was sinless if he can do that we can certainly just have one meal a day in the evening really yeah. not that much of a sacrifice but people lived that way for thousands of years they would only have one meal a day i mean we're just so spoiled and fat and if you think earth. about this i thought about this too in my work think about before refrigeration you know, and, you know, you might have to say no to this meal because you're fasting. You don't know when your next meal is. It yeah. might not be tomorrow. So by saying no to this second meal presented to you and you can't preserve it, what kind of a sacrifice was that? Well, you didn't necessarily know if you were yeah. going to get another one. We yeah. don't have that problem. They trusted much more in God, too. And I feel like a lot of people don't talk about that, too, the, the trust and the prayer that they had of saying no before refrigeration, totally different mindset. So I really wish more priests would study fasting, that they would get into these specifics so they could advise and provide these remedies, you know, just like a, a medical doctor or a surgeon needs to provide a, you know, myriad of remedies to people with patients. There are people in confession, you know, certainly who need to be told for penance, I need you to adopt this strict fast for a certain period of time or in spiritual direction or in homilies. This is an antidote for yeah. souls. And I, I think, think almost everybody heard, needs it. I don't think I've ever gotten a penance or heard a homily on fasting. Wow. That's, that's, that really well, if I was crazy. a priest there, you'd hear it about every I'm week. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we Matt, didn't Matt. have any, any, any socials after mass involving food. <laughs> oh, Good man. thing Matt, Anthony doesn't have to worry about this. He, this year does either. chain smoking negate the fast? I actually, <laughs> holy cow, man. If I gave up smoking, I could give up eating. That's how I felt. Because I smoked for 23 years, I had I was smoking a pack and a half a day. Then the vape on top of that. If I could give that mm. up, I could give food up. That's how I'm looking at it. Right. So, Master um, yourself. You know, how do you grow yeah. in virtue if you can't say no and if you can't discipline yourself? Fasting helps people do so. And I think it's really important for men to do so, especially men with families. If you can't, 
you know, say no and grow in holiness and develop virtue, you know, especially in um, moderation. How, how can you take tackle all the really serious problems you're facing? You're just saying no to a meal over lunch, basically, to wait for dinner. And sure, maybe you can't eat everything you want, but in our society now, there's so many great vegetarian meals or even vegan meals. You know, back then they didn't have, you know, soy burgers and other things where technically they don't violate the fast. You know, um, I mean, maybe they're not very good, but these people <laughs> relied on very basic ingredients is the point, you know, and uh, they certainly, you know, necessarily didn't taste good. I talk about in the book during during Lent, the Holy Week fast was even stricter where it was yeah. only bread, salt, herbs. That's basically all you're eating. Mm. You know, maybe some dry vegetables. And the first 40 hours of Lent, Ash Wednesday, if you could, you don't eat anything. And same thing with the last 40 hours on Good Friday until, you know, for Holy Saturday, 40 hours, nothing. You know, that's the kind of rigor we're looking for, you know. That's, yeah. you know, and 40 hours too. Why? Because our Lord was in the tomb 40 hours. So each of those hours is offered up for an hour that he lay dead in the tomb. I, I Catholic arrows. I, I don't know if you smoke cigarettes uh, today, actually tomorrow. So no, November 9th will be two months that I quit. I never thought I would quit. I, I really thought I would go to my grave dying of lung cancer. So if anybody out there smokes and thinks I'm never going to be able to give this thing up. It is possible. That's all I can tell you. Cause it was the hardest thing I ever had to give up. But it is possible. It's just you really do just have to offer it up and just suffer through mm -hmm. it. But it's possible. And, and so. talking about cancer, I mean, there's so many benefits from fasting, too, to prevent cancer, preventing different ailments. Uh, you know, dermatologists even recommended, too, for a number of ailments. So there's a lot. Of, we can be said on that. We won't talk about it. But there's a lot of physical benefits, too. So our Lord gives yeah. us these spiritual benefits and is almost uh, an additional benefit, you know, extra on the top that we physically can benefit from it oh man matthew thank you so much for doing this with us man I, it's always uh, an edifying show when you come on i want to make sure that we get you on every time like there's something coming up that that we could is there any other topics that you're this well versed in uh the two topics i i really focus on the most uh, that i enjoy the most really goes with feast and fast the feast and the fast so these forgotten holy days of obligation and, and the history regarding them and how we no longer practice them and how they, you know, really spiraled out along with the fasting as well. So, I mean, you really We're need to get you back on and we'll talk about next time. Maybe next we'll talk about the holy days of obligation because anytime you come on, it's, it's such a rich show. It's because we, we're always trying to find the balance between obviously talking about what's going on in the church because not, mm -hmm. but not in a, in a negative way all the time, but the balance between talking about the joys of the faith some of these traditions that we've lost, humor, and we want to have like a nice balanced show that so people aren't catching the same thing every time they tune in. We want to give mm -hmm. people a really well balanced, um, just just different variety of different things about being Catholic. So That's we'll good. Uh, we'll set we'll set something else up. We and have you back on, man. I, I, That's I great. really I've really enjoyed talking to you over the over the past year or so. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we could meet through uh, through Father Lovell. You know, that was really, you know, providential. I'm glad, you know, it's worked out. And, uh, you know, above all, just make sure everybody understands that it's all about living the faith, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Learn it. But if you don't live it, it's, it's really worthless. You know, you got, you got yeah, to guys, have if, to learn it. If you didn't see Matthew's talk at the Coalition for Canceled Priests, it's up on their YouTube channel. He gave a talk on fasting on their YouTube channel. I gave a talk at that conference also. So if you if you guys never saw my talk or Matthew's talk, go check those out. They're actually really Matthew's was like it, he left everybody speechless. It, it was it was a phenomenal talk. At least I wasn't giving the talk during lunch. You know, I did yeah, right <laughs> fasting during lunch once at a lunch, and you know how awkward that is. <laughs> you know, Not everybody, dessert. you do just I'm shaming like, everyone while they eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that that was that was definitely some people feeling a little bit awkward there as i going on and on about not eating oh man <laughs> yeah oh, all right funny. matthew thank you so much man we'll do this again we'll set up uh we'll set up another stream yeah we'll thank you great seeing you, you guys on. again awesome yep. all right rob take us out brother mm -hmm.